who is a co-founder and CEO of Wave, the London-based you know, uh, company pioneering AI to scale autonomous vehicles to complex, never seen uh, environment. Alex is a world expert in deep learning and computer vision before founding Wave. Alex was a, re a research fellow and PhD at Cambridge. Uh, many of you might know Alex from his uncertain quantification for you know perception work. He's really you know one of the pioneer work in our domain. Uh, Alex leadership and vision has led Wave to become one of the most exci exciting startups in vehicle the autonomous vehicle market. Let's welcome Alex. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the really kind introduction, uh, and it's going to—I think it's going to be an exciting talk today because I, uh, you know, we've been working on the. This can play okay. So we've been working on end-to-end -end deep learning for autonomous driving for almost six years now at Wave, and uh, if anything, I feel like this year uh, has provided some of the, you know, I'm going to go as far as saying big breakthroughs that are are really making uh, this method viable and feasible. Um, I'm looking forward to sharing some of the, if this can come on, I'm looking forward to sharing some of these with you today. Uh, and in particular, uh, uh, you know, one result that we haven't talked about publicly yet, which um, uh, which I, I'm really curious to get everyone's feedback on. Do you know how to get, is this on the adapter side or shall I try this one? All right. Bear with me while we uh, set this back up again. How's that? Great. All right. Where was I? So um, uh, today I want to talk to talk to you all about the frontiers of embodied AI. And to start off with, uh, I wanted to give a motivating example for why uh, you know why it is such a challenging problem to to address autonomous driving it is to, to be able to create an autonomous driving agent you need to have uh, to be able to deal with such diverse sets of, of scenarios I'm just showing a bunch of different driving videos and you can see the diversity in appearance and behavior and agents in the scene uh, and it really is a true open set problem so what we found is that you need to go beyond a um, you know specific uh, task driven AI to create um, to create a really robust and, and uh, intelligent system that can deal with that long tail to be able to succeed in this space. Uh, and fundamentally, um, I think that this this uh, I think that the holy grail of the autonomous driving space is going to be solved by building an AI solution to the problem. And this has really driven um, the approach that we've taken at Wave. So what is that? So uh, to quickly over, um, quickly introduce uh, what we've been working on, we're taking a uh, an end-to-end -end deep learning approach to the autonomous driving problem. So that means that uh, our stack that is today running on our fleet in the UK has an end-to-end -end deep learning model, a you know, billion parameter model that has uh, uh, raw sensor input and a motion plan output. And our belief is that by building that kind of uh, learning system with, uh, with the right set of data infrastructure and feedback is what's going to allow autonomous driving to scale. Uh, we think of this as a next generation approach to autonomy in AV 2.0, and I've listed some of the, the you know, key features of this approach. Uh, the first one is that generaliza uh, generalization is you know, going to be absolutely key to getting autonomy to scale. And for us, AV 2.0 is characterized by a system that is easy to generalize and adapt to new places uh, without needing uh, significant engineering in each new environment. So for example, without a requirement of high definition maps. Uh, the second one is that it's vehicle friendly and can operate with a low uh, bill of materials cost. So moving away from the um, expensive 30 camera, six radar, six LIDAR setups, uh, but moving to a setup that makes it economically viable and feasible to integrate into fleets at scale. And then the third one is creating um, this, this fleet learning framework that allows us to align behavior with uh, human expectations to really create uh, a system that has trust and safety. Uh, today, we uh, operate these vehicles here, a Jaguar I-PACE, as well as electric vans. And if you look at the results of what we've been able to see with the end-to-end -end deep learning system is that it's able to operate with really substantial robustness, even when it rains and snows in London, um, uh, you know, uh, 
this is a system that can drive and deal with the kind of complexity of environment uh, that, that we need to be able to operate in. I mentioned uh, generalization. Uh, well, what we've been able to see so far is that we can generalize between those two different types of vehicles um, that I showed, the passenger vehicle and the van. Uh, what that means is that we've got a single neural network that can learn to drive both of those vehicles with the same parameters. So it's, a, it's agnostic to sense opposed to vehicle geometry. Um, but not only that, uh, we've been able to generalize to different geographies. So our, we predominantly learn to drive in London. Uh, but we've been over uh, in over 10 UK cities now, and we see that the system can drive in those cities despite having no training experience from them. Uh, so I guess what we're trying to show with these results is that we are moving towards building a general purpose uh, learning system for driving. And don't take my word for it. Uh, we had the chance to host uh, Bill Gates for a ride a couple of months ago, actually. And this is uh, myself, our safety operator, Deeper, and Bill in the car uh, driving through central London. We picked him up as at his hotel and, uh, um, and, and went for a, a drive through the busy streets of Soho and King's Cross and even stopped along the way for some fish and chips. Uh, have a look at the video on YouTube if you, uh, if you want. It's, it's quite, it's, it was quite, quite a fun one. Today, we are, uh, are starting commercial trials and really uh, looking at uh, how we can start to realize commercial impact with this technology. And so we were excited to launch a couple of months ago, um, a last mile grocery trial in London. Now, the neat thing about that is that our autonomy is dropped straight into the operations of our partners, Ocado and Asda, uh, and is able to access in that trial just from one site in Northwest London, access over 170,000 customers um, because it can drive on new routes every day, routes it's never been on before um, at all times of day in all weathers. Uh, and you know these, these, these trials are demonstrating the power of this, this um, AV 2.0 approach. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of context of, of where we're at uh, as, a, um, as a company and uh, where our technology is at today. What I wanted to spend this talk talking to you about was where the frontier is of embodied intelligence. But before we do so, I just want to uh, uh, spend some time reflecting on where the frontier of AI is this year. Uh, and I'm sure many of you will have been inspired by some of the breakthroughs we've seen, things like uh, AlphaGo, ChatGPT, um, or DALI, or you, know, you, could, you could go on and list many of these, these, um, these, these breakthroughs that have really transformed what we can do with AI technology. The interesting thing to me is that there's a bunch of foundations that underpin all of these results. And you know, they're surprisingly common and shared across all of these major breakthroughs. Uh, let me just run through some of the major ones for me. The first one is, is data sets and benchmarks. Uh, often underappreciated, uh, the interesting to, thing to me is that typically data sets and benchmarks are what catalyze the breakthrough itself. You know, take image recognition, for example. Convolutional nets were, were um, you know, first proposed in 1989, yet it was the ImageNet data set in the 2010s that made that a solved problem. Games and simulation. Um, the, the key thing here for me is, is being able to move with, with fast feedback. And I think games and simulation provide an ability to iterate at the speed of software. Self-supervised learning. Of course, self-supervised learning is, uh, is, is really, uh, we heard a lot about it in the last talk, but it's really the, the, the key thing to be able to uh, remove the need of labeled data and learn on, on you know, data at extraordinary scale. Foundation models, um, to be able to learn general purpose models with emergent behavior. Of course, scalable compute and architecture, it's the, a remarkable result that we can see uh, fairly predictable growth and performance as you scale up data and compute and training across many different AI tasks. Multimodality, I'm keen to talk a bit more about this in this presentation uh, uh, and why it, can, you know, why it can be so powerful in particular for embodied AI. And finally, alignment with human goals, being able to train these systems to, uh, to get the trust and safety that, that we need. All of these foundations have really underpinned uh, those breakthroughs. And the point I want to make today is that I think the same, these same foundations are going to be what um, changes the game for embodied AI. So I'd like to share three examples in particular with how, um, you know, uh, with how they apply into the embodied AI space. Uh, I think embodied AI is, is going to be, you know, my, my prediction is I think over the next couple of years, we're going to see uh, much more, you know, uh, a great amount of impact realized from, from some of these large language models and you know, internet scale generative AI. 
But I think embodied AI gives us the opportunity to go beyond, you know, all of the internet text and video that I think we've all almost exhaustively used to, to power some of these systems. Embodied AI gives us another data source to fuel even more advanced development of AI systems. Of course, we live in a physical world, and uh, I think in 10 years' time, when we think of AI, it won't be a LLM, it'll be an embodied physical system. Um, and so for me, that's why this is such a fundamentally important mission to work on. Uh, so what are we going to cover today? Well, uh, the the three um, uh, the three really exciting pieces of work that uh, I feel fortunate to present on behalf of all of my colleagues that have made this possible. Uh, uh, these are this is what we're going to be talking about. First one is reinforcement learning for driving. Uh, second one is bringing language into the driving domain, and finally some new results from world models. Uh, so let me dive into each of these three, starting with reinforcement learning for driving. This one touches on uh, these two foundational building blocks, uh, on games and simulation and alignment with human goals. But I wanted to start off by uh, you know, going back a few years to the very beginning of our work at WAVE. This was some early work from 2018, where we actually put, for the first time, a reinforcement learning agent on a real-life physical autonomous vehicle with vision input. And this is a, uh, it's a model-free uh, RL agent trained with the the task uh, with the reward of trying to drive as far as it can without safety driver intervention. Uh, this is actually me as a safety operator, and the interesting thing here is that um, it started off uh, optimized from scratch. Uh, sorry, initialized uh, uh, randomly, and you can see after a few uh, few you know episodes that it, it, it can't drive and drives off the road. But after a little bit more training, you can see that it's learned a policy that is somewhat stable and can keep it in the middle of the road. Yet it oscillates and it's it's you know not still still not very good. But after ten episodes of learning, so you you can see a, a few more pieces of feedback, it's able to learn to do basic lane following, and that was really cool because we saw for the first time learning in front of our eyes, we could actually get the vehicle to you know essentially learn to drive. But of course, it's a very very uh, simple uh, environment, and uh, you know you. Uh, Here's what we've done. Uh, what we've done is a, uh, a, a multi-agent reinforcement learning um, paradigm where we can train uh, diverse and large-scale driving agents in simulation. Our simulator, the Infinity Simulator, gives us a procedurally generated world um, of uh, exceptional diversity. And we can run this with um, hundreds of agents at 700 times faster than real time. We train these agents from uh, low dimensional tokenized input from the simulator itself. Uh, and the, the, what, the thing that's really exciting behind this is that we don't just train you know, one agent, we treat all of these agents independently and we can learn uh, both um, you know, good and expert driving as well as uh, diverse and adversarial driving to ensure we have a robust world. Now the rewards we set in this world are very simple. They're, don't hit anything and obey a few basic traffic rules, but it's a really light touch reward paradigm. And given this environment, we see some remarkable emergent behavior emerge. So let me, uh, let, let me show you. Here's one example. So you can see our vehicle here pauses and waits for the gap before coming through. Uh, this kind of um, um, emergent, let's say, co cooperation uh, comes out of training. Or well, this one here with some quite complex giveaway scenarios. Uh, again, this all comes out of, of that, that training paradigm. Uh, and so this is, you know, this is neat. We can see that with increasing training and scale, we can essentially um, solve the driving problem of complex urban driving uh, in, in simulation. Uh, and you can see some of the results that we can now populate our world with agents that far outperform any hand-coded agent we can create. Uh, and they learn all kinds of behaviors from conservative driving through to adversarial driving. Uh, and, and you know, populating this world gives us an environment to, um, to really accelerate the development of our autonomy. And of course, I mentioned that these agents were trained from um, uh, low dimensional uh, you know, uh, uh, privileged information from the simulator. Of course, we can distill this into a non-privileged driving policy that takes image inputs and can drive um, with, with, uh, with similar capabilities. But now we might ask the question, okay, this is in sim, how do we get it in the real world? Well, to that end, um, 
uh, we can address this into real, how do we address this into real domain gap? One of the interesting things to see is we can actually go the other way. We can train a policy just on real world data and then deploy it in our simulator. And here you can see that um, this is a driving agent that's trained just on real world data, now driving in our simulated world. And so we see that the, even though uh, you can see from that result, even though there is a domain gap um, that you can observe, we still get fairly robust transfer. Uh, we can push that even further by using neural rendering techniques, uh, um, NERF, uh, other methods. And um, you can see here an example of uh, you know, us testing a policy in, uh, in one of our NERF worlds. And so this gives us fairly photorealistic uh, uh, environments. You know, we can adapt camera pose and all that kind of thing uh, as we move between different vehicles and, and, uh, and you know, test largely in static worlds, although we're working on adding dynamic agents into our NERF environments as well. Uh, so to summarize, in this section, uh, we've been able to show that we can train really effective reinforcement learning agents in a multi-agent setting in simulation. And our simulator is becoming effective enough that we can see transfer into the real world. Um, and so, you know, where are the opportunities from here? How can we develop rewards that can function effectively in the real world? And of course, continue to improve the sim to real gap uh, even further. Uh, let's move on to the next section, which is about language meets driving. I think this is really exciting to me because, um, uh, you know, because it builds on a lot of the transformational results we've seen from large language models. And it's work that we haven't talked about publicly yet uh, 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 and, and until today, in fact, uh, at some of the talks at CBPR today. So um, really curious to get everyone's feedback, but this really touches on the multimodality foundation. Um, and in particular, uh, uh, let, me, let me start off with some motivation of why we want to consider language when we're thinking about driving. This is something that would have seen, seemed absurd to me a couple of years ago, but I've become deeply convicted that uh, language is an, a massive accelerant to driving. So uh, the thing we know is that language, uh, LLMs already know a huge amount about driving. Now, if you take, for example, um, ChatGPT and ask it some basic questions, like if you're driving and a bull rolls out onto the road, what should you do next? It tells you you should, you should stop. If you're doing it next to a school, it, it reasons correctly that it's more likely a child might run after the bull. And if you say, if it's at midnight, uh, then it reasons correctly that it's unlikely children are going to be playing on the road at midnight. So there's a bunch of really interesting um, inherent knowledge that's present in these LLMs. You can ask other questions like, what should I do if I'm approaching an intersection and I see a motorcycle with no one on the top of it driving? And it actually reasons that, oh, that's a really weird thing to see on the road. And so you can see it starts to know what is expected or unexpected um, on, on our roads. I'd also, people often say uh, a, a picture is worth a thousand words, but I'm going to make the opposite argument that a paragraph is worth a thousand pictures. And here's why. If you think about the scene here, um, what do you need to learn from it? Well, you need to learn that there's pedestrians on the pedestrian crossing, so you need to slow down for them. Uh, it's a T intersection. You need to make a decision whether you're going left or right. You need to give way. And actually, there's a, a 20 mile an hour speed sign as well. So you need to change your speed. That's probably the description that you need to learn from this. But if you were to learn that from simply, um, you know, self-supervised way watching videos, that would be that would take you gigabytes, if not petabytes, of video to learn those concepts. What I just told you is less than a kilobyte of text. And the point I'm trying to make is that although there's more information content in images and videos, the signal to noise in text, the um, accuracy and specificity of that data, is orders of magnitude higher. There's a reason why we've developed language to communicate between our human brains, between each other, and it's because it's the most effective way to communicate information. And I think we're going to see the same with embodied AI and robotics. So we've done exactly that. We've built a system that, uh, we've, we've trained a system that, that uh, is able to ground a large language model in driving. And this is really exciting. Have a look at some of the results. We have a, uh, our, our driving AI can not only drive, but we can query it and, and start to ask it questions. For example, if you look at this uh, question that we're asking about this driving scene, should we start and proceed through this intersection? And, and we actually start to ask our model why. Um, have a look at the answer it gives. It's quite remarkable. This, um, this AI tells us that no, we shouldn't uh, proceed because the traffic light is red. It's important to obey the traffic signals and wait for a green light. And it warns us around all of the agents in the scene. Let me show you another one. 
Uh, this is quite a fun one. Should you honk at the pedestrians crossing the road? Uh, the, the, uh, the AI explains to us, no, you shouldn't honk at the pedestrians crossing the road because they've got right of way and they're, they're crossing on a, on a green signal. Um, and so, you know, we can start to query this, the, uh, our driving AI. And I think, why is this powerful? Well, I think it opens up a number of opportunities, whether this is for interpretability or explainability or actually understanding what the system, why the system is, is behaving in a certain way by improving the performance, by bringing in the knowledge from, from language, uh, or perhaps even a, a future solution to uh, remote assistance. If you want to help uh, your driving AI in a situation it can't understand, you might want to give it a text prompt. Here's what it looks like in a video. So this is our system um, uh, driving through London and explaining what it's doing. And you can see it's actually giving a commentary. Uh, we've prompted it, asking it to, to explain its driving. And you can see it's turning left, it's following the route, it's maintaining speed, and then, oh, actually, we're stopping down. And it, it even explains it's stopping um, because there's pedestrians on the crossing. Well, let me show you another one. I think this is fascinating. It's correctly describing that it's slowing down because there's a cyclist ahead. Uh, we overtake the cyclist, and then it's slowing down because there's pedestrians at the zebra crossing. And this, um, uh, you know, this, this language model, uh, sorry, this, this driving area can now start to, to actually commentate and explain its driving. Um, and I can show more. This is another interesting example where, uh, again, remember, we don't drive with an HD map. This is driving based on what it sees, and we're being told to go straight and actually explaining that it needs to change lanes to follow its intended route, uh, to go through the lane that, that allows it to pass straight ahead. Um, so you can see that just with um, some, some very initial training, it's able to learn concepts like um, pedestrians, cyclists, traffic signals, lane changing. I think this is really exciting and opens up a new, a new forefront for embodied AI. Uh, right now, we're capable of explaining our driving in text, but I think we're really close to being able to do the other way, to be able to prompt our driving with text. Uh, and so I guess the, uh, there's many opportunities from here, but one I'm really excited about is not just grounding uh, vision and language, but also action. Um, it's also worth commenting that large language models, uh, we know that they're frequent in the way that they hallucinate, um, and that will be a challenge here as well. But uh, I think the important thing to, to think about here is how do we bring um, how do we allow these systems to reason about their uncertainty and, and actually um, uh, you know, know what they don't know? For example, we saw a, a, an example where it said it thought that a motorcyclist without anyone on top was weird. It should know that and be able to reason about when it might not know something and not be forced to hallucinate, uh, but be aware of that. Uh, but ultimately, I think this does provide extraordinary opportunities to improve the confidence and the understanding in our driving AI through language. Would love to know what you think. Uh, let me move on to the final section, uh, world modeling, where I'm, I'm really excited to talk about a new result uh, that we've developed at Wave uh, Gaia that we, uh, uh, that we released for the first time a couple of days ago. Um, but... World modeling, it really touches on all of these foundations. I think it's the holy grail of, of intelligence. If you have a world model which can predict and understand the world, I mean, that's the, the closest definition that I can think of of, a, of, a, of an AGI, of, a, of a, true, um, a, a true AI. Now, of course, we're building a narrow um, world model, a world model for, for driving scenes, but being able to predict and understand the world is, is you know, that, that, that for me is, is, is true intelligence. And it, it touches on all of these different aspects. All of these things are required to make this work. Why do we need to develop world models? Well, to drive well, it's really important that you understand um, what's, how a scene's gonna evolve. If I ask you how you should drive given this image, it's really hard to tell whether this white car is going to pull out in front of us or not. And of course, when you see the video, we're able to actually understand intuitively and predict what's happening. So that's why world modeling is uh, important. Uh, but what is a world model? Well, um, a world model is a generative model that is able to predict the next state conditioned on an action. So it's really, it's a model that can um, allow us to predict how the world is going to unfold given a decision that we make. And of course, this is, uh, this is incredibly useful across the board uh, for, for, for autonomy. It lets us actually look at counterfactuals to re-simulate, uh, to learn from this environment, uh, from, from this world model. And in fact, it's, it's really uh, how uh, we learn in our human brains. Um, there's a lot of evidence that our hippocampus, the world models in our, in our brain, are able to replay experiences and many different permutations from what we've experienced in order to improve our motor behavior. And I, I you know, 
my expectation is we'll see the same from embodied AI. It opens up model-based reinforcement learning and imitation learning opportunities, uh, or allows you to do search-based planning. You know, if you want to go down the, 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 the tree search method that, that solved AlphaGo, for example. Some of the um, you know, work that's been talking about this for the last few years that really inspired me was uh, a paper from David Haar and, and Schmidt Huber on world models, uh, or a paper that scaled up these approaches, Dreamer v2. Uh, more recently, Yann LeCun wrote an um, opinion paper uh, arguing that world modeling was the, the, you know, one of the biggest missing building blocks to creating embodied intelligence. Uh, I agree with him. We've actually also been working on it at Wave for many years. Uh, another flashback to 2018, uh, we trained a world model back on that same quiet country road that I showed you that reinforcement learning demo from. Uh, and here's the example. I think this was a, I can't remember, it was something like a 10,000 parameter MLP that encoded into a 16 dimensional latent representation. It was really tiny uh, back then. But what we found is, uh, and you can read the blog post from, from, from many years ago, but what we found is that training that world model on some recorded data from this road, we could learn to drive on that road despite never having, with no on-policy interaction. And so even with that very rudimentary world model, uh, we were able to learn how to drive on a road through just imagination and experience by unrolling that world model. Um, since that work, we've uh, we've been able to scale it up. But you know, first we, uh, again, if you want to look through the, the history of, of, of our work here, uh, Fiery was a paper where we worked on um, using semantic labels and a bird's eye representation to better structure the world model to scale it up to busy and dynamic scenes. We showed multimodality, we showed um, diversity, and then Mile connected this with imitation learning and integrated it, but only in simulation. Uh, if you want to uh, you know, read more about the Mile architecture just quickly, it was a, um, a recurrent model that encoded into that bird's eye view space could recursively go forward uh, and decode into not just um, perception outputs, but, but also action. There's been, uh, outside way, there's also been a, a, a ton of work uh, that's, that's worth mentioning. Um, things like NVIDIA DriveGAN or other diffusion modeling around videos at various levels of accuracy. Uh, but this has been a really hot topic for the rightly reason that Yann LeCun points out that it's of a video generative model on action. I wouldn't argue it's a world model. It's simply generating a plausible video. It's conditioned on style and things like this, but it's not generated on action. Um, and again, with, with various levels of performance and robustness. But what I want to show you today is the results of Gaia 1. This is a model we've only had access to for a couple of weeks, but it's truly extraordinary. I think it is a, represents a step change in capabilities of world modeling for embodied AI. Um, so Gaia 1, Generative AI for Autonomy. Uh, let me show you some of the results. This, this is something we released yesterday. And the thing that I'm excited to share, if you remember that very first slide I showed you of the array of videos, these were not real driving videos. All of these videos were generated from Gaia 1. All of these videos here are samples from our world model and represents the diversity that we can generate. So let me talk through the properties and dive into to some of the features of this model in more detail. So Gaia 1 is a self-supervised autoregressive world model, and it's capable of being conditioned not just from video, but also text and action prompts. So crucially, it is an interactive world model. It's got an incredibly tempor temporally coherent and accurate representation. It can look at multimodality. Um, and crucially, we see safe and emergent driving behavior within this world model. This is uh, a, a sequence generated from the world model. It's entirely synthetically generated from a short video prompt. And you can see that we learn to drive down this quiet road. We imagine feasible and realistic scenarios that come up uh, and it's temporally stable over, I think this is, um, this is, this video has been sped up uh, four times, but I think it's something like a two minute sequence. The results were, were mind blowing to me when I, when I first saw them. So the architecture itself is, as you could imagine, it's an autoregressive architecture. It takes um, uh, image, 
uh, sorry, video, text, and, and action uh, inputs, and encodes them into, uh, into tokens and feeds them into this autoregressive world model that we can decode into the video you just saw. Here's some more results. You can see that it's able to model pedestrians, um, traffic behavior, signals like, uh, like, uh, like traffic lights, uh, roadworks, many other things that, uh, that we find in our training data. Uh, we're able to see different weathers, different lighting conditions. We can look at different futures, so we can sample at multiple times. You can see the same video prompt. We fit in the same few frames, and it's able to, um, uh, and it's able to model a diverse futures from that prompt. So here you can see, um, you know, one, we look at what happens if we turn left at this intersection. Uh, one even imagines a different intersection. You know, all of this stuff is include, uh, occluded from the original prompt, and so it's uncertain what might be there. And so the world model is able to look at the distribution of things that might happen in the future. It's, it's truly remarkable. And one in that bottom right, we saw a pedestrian come across the road. Here's another example where we turn right and uh, you know we don't know what we might expect down that right turn, right? Because it's occluded as well. And so here we can start to, um, we can again sample and look at those different futures. I guess the, what these results show is that we can genuinely look at diverse and um, uh, 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 diverse and multimodal futures from this initial prompt. And these are all from video prompts. Uh, we can also condition on action. So here you're going to see the model play forward, and then we're going to condition it with different action commands. And you can see when the model starts turning, it's when we trigger that action command from a slight left or a slight right to a hard turn. And you can see that the world model correctly um, uh, 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 correctly uh, um, synthesizes uh, the world evolving based on that action. And this is what makes this, I think, a a real step advancement from the uh, video generative models uh, as it's a true world model that we can drive in. Look at this. When are we conditioning it on a, on a random walk of a sinusoid as, 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 uh, as input into the model? And you can see we drive around and it's got remarkable consistency. Even when we drive off the road, you know, it's never had any training data driving on the footpath. We don't drive our cars there. Um, but you can see the, the model is still able to um, synthesize remarkably robustly and even uh, you know, our action and understand and model how that will affect others' actions and vice versa. But this one's truly exciting to me. It's a similar thing. We put in the same sinusoid and you can see us drive around, uh, particularly as we get significantly out of distribution. And look at this. We go out of distribution to the point where we're driving on grass and then we drive into you know, a bush. This is entirely synthesized and it is truly out of distribution. And so the fact that the world model can show coherent data when we're going this far out of the lane for me was, was mind blowing. And this is all action conditioned from that initial video prompt and then driving with this, uh, it's just a random sign you sort of put in. But let me, um, let me just pause it. The thing that I, I've been staring at these for the last few days, they're, they're amazing. But look at this. If, if you can see that really thin structure there, it's maybe a pixel or less wide. As we drive forward, um, see how it holds its, its space and time. Uh, I'm going to play that again. I think it's a really, really interesting thing to look at. You can see that that thin structure uh, stays, you know, stay, stays there in a way that's um, consistent in the 3D scene. Um, for me, that's, that, that was really exciting to see. I think two, two or three more final results here. You can see uh, where we condition it now on text. So I've shown you how we condition it on video, on action, and now text, we're saying turn left or turn right. And you can see that it made a left or right turn depending on the, the text we condition it on. And it's uh, that same language grounding that I was showing you before. Similarly, this one, this is not prompted on any starting video or any starting action. We only give it a text prompt. We say going around a stop bus. And this video is entirely synthetically generated from that text prompt. So there's, there's no input video. And you can see there, it's been able to produce a scene that you know, quite accurately matches the text prompt. We can look at counterfactuals. So here, the same video prompt, but different text prompts. And you can see um, we can play, play it forward and, and, and look at different counterfactuals, whether the light turned green, which way we turn, or if it stays red. Uh, and uh, all of these scenes are, are imagined forward from, from the world model. This one's quite cool because it's, uh, we prompt it halfway through this video to go from this rainy day uh, to a nighttime, and you can see it gradually transfers it to nighttime. So we can um, change the weather, change the time of day, uh, and all of this is controllable through uh, through prompting. 
Um, so, you know, look, we, um, every, uh, uh, so, 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 uh, sorry, I'm getting some feedback. So, uh, so what's next here? So, uh, uh, so this is a model that, as I said, we've had it for a few weeks and every day we're discovering new capabilities. Um, it's a relatively small model, right? It's less than a billion parameters. And what we're gonna be doing over the next uh, weeks and months is scaling it up to billions of parameters of scale, more data, uh, and you know, uh, the results we're seeing so far is a, is a really meteoric uh, growth curve. Um, but of course, the key benefits come when we integrate this world model into our driving AI. And I think that's what I'm truly excited to see, to see the improvements in trust and safety that we can see as a result. Uh, so let me, let me conclude. Uh, I, I think the points that I hope uh, that you can take away from today is that autonomous driving, it is an AI problem. Gone are the days where you can solve it with a perception planning mapping stack, where you can divide up to the problem into different components, uh, where you can rely on uh, safety assuring each component in isolation. The way that this is going to be solved is going to be the same as, as Go, same as AlphaGo, same as ChatGPT. It's going to be through end-to-end -end deep learning. And in fact, the foundations that have uh, made some of those breakthroughs are already starting to accelerate driving. Um, we believe that world models and language, as some of the examples I've shown you today, are going to be results that provide meaningful step change capabilities to the intelligence of our system um, and ultimately be what brings us autonomy um, at, at scale. Um, you've seen some of the results we're building at Wave, and we're just getting started. Uh, I, I couldn't present this work without all the incredible colleagues that I, I get to work with, many of whom are at the conference. Uh, so please do come say hi to us. If this is work that interests you, uh, whether it's um, academic or research collaborations, or if you're interested in joining our team, we're absolutely looking to grow this. And I would uh, love to have a conversation. My contact details are at the bottom. Um, please do come chat or get in touch. If not, I'll be glad to take questions. Thank you so much. questions for the sake of time we will take uh, four questions uh, uh, awesome talk uh, so i'm trying to figure out wh what are the guiding principles you see uh you know these approaches right and just, just uh, use an uh you know think about large language model right there are two guiding principles right one is um you know the the skinning law right so essentially as you uh skill uh data uh compute, right, and model capacity, uh, and then you you get better, right? And then there's a, there is a thinking called compression is intelligence. So essentially, you know, language model just compressing your data, and then as you scale, you're keep compressing, compressing, and then really sort of raising and all these things come because you need it to compress the data better. So what are the getting principles you think for autonomous driving? Uh, do you have this scaling law or, or the, sure. you know, compression is intelligence? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so the, the results I've been excited about are the scaling laws you see in large language models um, with data and compute. And we're seeing the same thing for the control problems. Um, ultimately, of course, the interesting thing for us is we're limited by the onboard inference compute we have. But there, um, you know, I think... I wouldn't bet against the rate that we're seeing algorithms get more efficient and the improvements we're seeing in onboard compute. Um, but we will regardless push that to, to the limit. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, what's the, the specific so, well, question? I, I guess- Compression is intelligence. Mm. Essentially is driving your, you know, your system much better, right? Large language to do much yes. more capable, to be more capable, you know. You want to see these systems compress yeah to produce behavioral concepts, right? You don't want to have right. them memorize or just um, uh, you know, copycat from the training data. You want to have them compressed so that they're truly understanding these concepts and they're grounding them between the different modalities of training data. Um, that's what we're really looking to push here. Okay, is the same principle you're saying? You're essentially also compressing yeah. the data. Okay, thanks. Thank you for the presentation. Um, what are your thoughts on when you're generating with Gaia, like? A, a, a video, for instance, I see, I saw you were generating for UK based uh, location, right? Mm. Because you were driving on the left. Mm. Well, you wanna, if you wanted to generate that for a city when you drive on the right, would that, would that be a problem? No, it's, it's just a matter of additional training data. There is fundamentally no difference with driving data from the US to the UK, for example, or 
Canada where you drive on the right. Um, I think there is going to be different behavior, you know, like for example, um, four-way stop signs. We don't see those in the UK, but you see them in North America, things like this. Uh, but ultimately, if you have the training data that has those experiences, um, then Gaia will be able to, to reproduce it. Thank you. Alex, fascinating talk. Uh, I can see this so many times and I'm going to be equally fascinated and had the privilege to seeing it slightly earlier. So it stayed with my mind, the part where you had the LLM describe the behavior of the algorithm. And I think you guys cracked the code of explainable AI, right? That's the true explanation. So my question to you is slightly kind of technical. And I mean, maybe you're going to say, I'm not allowed to say, but I'm really curious to understand how do you guys, so you prompt it with text and you also, I suppose, mm -hmm. get the text back out of it, but do you do joint models? Do you do train another model on top of it? And may, the reason mm -hmm. I'm asking is to understand how are you thinking about the fidelity of the explanation? How do we know it's aligned with the behavior? It's a single foundation model. So we feed in uh, video, text, or action prompts. Um, you know, we can drop them out during training. At inference time, you can see that we can pick and choose which ones we prompt in. Um, but the key thing is it's a single multimodal model. That's really important. Um, uh, if you train all these models separately, you won't get that, that joint and complementary training uh, by bringing them together. Uh, the second part of your question around uh, performance, I think, you know, we've seen we've seen three results that really push down the hallucinations and, and push up the performance. One is scale, um, so scaling data and compute and model size, you just see uh, improvement in accuracy. Uh, the second one is um, by introducing ability for the model to be aware of its own, own uncertainty and not forcing it to make predictions where it, it, it's not capable of. And then the third one is having, um, I guess, uh, imp algorithmic advances and improved grounding, whether these are, um, uh, auxiliary tasks or other structuring a way that you can help influence the causality of the model you know these are the kind of techniques that i um i think we've found promising to overcome uh you know hallucinations or or, or challenges in the model awesome absolutely fascinating thank you hi alex thanks for sharing the progress and the, your vision on the emerging technologies uh, i have a question about um, um Demonic agent RL simulator and also the world modeling. Mm -hmm. So this opens up uh, like opportunities for generating diverse behavior. However, there's a generative data. Sure. There's been a few approaches um, to, to thinking about that problem that I've seen. Uh, one of them is that if you can ensure that your simulator or your uh, virtual distribution is a superset of the real world, so for example, domain randomization, where you look to randomize beyond the bounds of the real world, then you can be more certain that the real world will exist in that subset somewhere. It's, it's perhaps inefficient, but it, it, gives you, uh, it gives you sufficiency around that. Um, the other one is that you measure the correlation and you know one of the key metrics for us is the correlation of various parts of our simulator and the whole simulator as a package um, and so we directly measure uh, uh, the correlation and performance on the real road compared to our, our simulator and you know look to to drive up that correlation got it thank you thank you for the great talk uh it may be a similar question but uh uh how the gaia one work in the real car or and what's the difficulty in integrating the Gaia, Gaia one into the real vehicle? So that's work we're starting to do now. Uh, this this model Gaia one is something we've just trained. And it's the results I'm showing you from offline offline inference right now, um, and we've just obtained them recently. Uh, I'm we're absolutely thrilled and excited about it. Uh, what's going to be coming next is we're going to be working on actually integrating it into our training. Uh, policy training and online, um, uh, you know, online driving algorithms. Um, there's a, an array of approaches we're trialing from um, synthetic data generation to model-based imitation and reinforcement learning. Uh, there's a ton of different ideas there. Uh, there's so much to do. Uh, so give us a few months, and and hopefully we can share more on that front. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, next, we have Pat to discuss about the very exciting new plan challenge, the results, the findings, and uh, the uh, award ceremony. All right, welcome, Matt. Pat. <laughs> Close enough. Let's see if we get this configured correctly. Yeah, so I'm 